evening, but I see a few new faces. So for those of you who were not able to join us last night for the opening session, I am Clark Irvin, the Executive Director of the Aspen Security Forum. We are so pleased that you're here with us for the debut of the Aspen Security Forum Global. As I mentioned last night, and for those of you who are new to Aspen for seven years now, we've hosted in our lovely campus in Aspen, Colorado, the Aspen Security Forum, which is a gathering of American government officials in national security, policy experts from outside government, and noted print and broadcast journalists to discuss and debate the issues of the day from a United States perspective with regard to national security. We are debuting here in London today, beginning last night, the global version of the forum, which will feature mostly non-American government officials, policy experts, and journalists to do likewise from a global perspective. We are very pleased to be here in London, given the special relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom, and we're off to a wonderful start this morning with a session on NATO and Russia, which we've titled Cold War Redux. To moderate this morning's session, we're very pleased to have with us John Gearson, who's a professor of National Security Studies at the Department of War Studies at King's College London. With that, John Gearson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. Um, as, as you heard, I'm a professor of National Security Studies at King's College, but also lead our Center for Defense Studies. But in the early part of my career, um, I was and continue to be a Cold War historian. So I was delighted to hear that the Cold War's back. Uh, <coughs> lots of material uh, for, uh, for, for future books uh, um, um, for scholars such as myself. Um, and in trying to unpick this question, I'm delighted that we have uh, my colleague from King's College, Sam Green, for the head of our uh, Russia Institute, uh, Sir Roderick Lyon, former ambassador to uh, Russia, the United Kingdom, and uh, Ambassador Lute, uh, the US, US ambassador to NATO at the moment, uh, who's described as a warrior diplomat in the, uh, in the write-up here. It was not uh, my description. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, go we're going from soft to hard power across the, uh, the panel this morning uh, as, as, as we move forward. Um, and in that order, I I'd like to open this up by uh, asking uh, Sam, um, what is driving the foreign policy of Russia at the moment? How can we, how can we unpick what it, its, its approach to NATO and the region? Well, thank you. First of all, thanks for the opportunity to, to, to be here. This is an important discussion. Um, I'll, I'll start off by saying that I don't think we're in a Cold War, and I don't think that we're in anything like what the old Cold, Cold War was like, simply because Russia is not anything like the, the Soviet Union. Um, it is um, uh, integrated and dependent on the global economy and on uh, very specific kinds of partnerships with the West uh, in ways that I don't think the Soviet Union um, uh, ever was. Um, and uh, that in, it, it gets involved in the lives and livelihoods of the people running the country uh, in ways that, that it never could or, 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 or would for the Soviet Union. And so uh, there are very real limits to this conflict. Um, but I think that um, what we're seeing um, is um, uh, actually finally a recognition on this side of the dividing line right, that um, the relationship between Europe and Russia in particular uh, is is geopolitical. We always understood that the relationship between Russia and the U.S. was geopolitical. It was talking about missiles and defense and things like that. But when we're talking about the relationship with Europe, Europe wanted to see things in non-zero-sum terms. Europe doesn't think about itself in, in, in geopolitical terms. It thinks about this great integrationist project of, of trade and free movement of, of capital and people and things like that. And um, what what Russia had been saying for a long time was that, in fact, um, uh, this was at least as much of a threat to it as, as NATO expansion. And so we've seen Russia go to war over um, a trade treaty. I don't think that that means that Russia is going to make a, a habit out of going to war uh, over trade treaties. Um, but uh, it has um, uh, proved a point uh, and demonstrated that it will uh, defend uh, a line. So the question is, why is that line um, so important? And I think it comes down to fundamentally the way that Russia is governed. Russia is governed. Um, in, it has done fairly well for its population over recent years, but frankly, um, is governed for the benefit of a rent-seeking uh, elite who um, uh, benefit from a system of economic and political competition that has uh, protect positions, is very mercantilist, uh, is, is, is very highly monopolized and highly concentrated, and you can make tremendous amounts of money uh, in, in, in Russia. Um, but uh, those sorts of corporations, those sorts of actors don't do very well in um, uh, rule of law environments that are governed more or less the way Europe is. And the more that Russia's neighborhood begins to become governed the way uh, that Europe is or tries to be, um, uh, the, uh, 
um, uh, the less rent, frankly, there is to distribute in, uh, in, in the Russian system, especially given that Russia at the moment is, is not growing. Um, uh, this is uh, an existential threat. Uh, to somebody like Putin, whose job is not simply to run uh, the economy and run the national security, but to keep this very hungry elite happy. I mean, I don't want to get into Brexit, but has the EU got this wrong? Why did they fail to understand uh, um, the things that you've just set out? Um, I think fundamentally because Brussels, uh, at least the, the, the EU side of Brussels, has never had a conversation about itself in geopolitical terms. It has thought that geopolitics was something that can and should be outsourced to the other side of Brussels, uh, where Ambassador Lutz sits, and um, to to Washington. Um, and that, um, uh, I mean, to a certain extent, not to put too fine a point on it, but um, uh, uh, there was uh, a lot of drinking of the Kool-Aid um, uh, going on. That, that this was a um, a win-win. Project. It's a win-win project if you are governed the way that most European states um, strive to be. Russia is not. All right. Um, let me bring Sir Roderick in here. I mean, is it a fair criticism that the international community, and certainly the Western powers, um, misread uh, Putin in the, in, and, and are to partly to blame for what we're now facing? Well, I think there's quite a lot of misreading that is still going on. Um, I think Putin has changed over the period of 16 years when he's been in power. And I'd just like to uh, quote something that he said 14 years and four days ago in his State of the Union address for um, 2002. Uh, the period of confrontation has ended. After 11 September last year, many, many people in the world realized that the Cold War was over. A different war is on, the war with international terrorism. Our major goal in foreign policy is to secure strategic stability in the world. To do this, we are participating in a new system of security. We maintain constant dialogue with the United States, and we work on changing the quality of our relations with NATO. Well, what a difference 14 years makes. Um, I completely agree with Sam. We're not in Cold War redux because the Soviet Union doesn't exist. We need a different paradigm for addressing Russia. <coughs> uh, but what we are dealing with is uh, certainly the most hostile and confrontational period in our relations with Russia or the Soviet Union over the past 30 years. Um, and we're also having to address something that is a continuum of not only Soviet, but also Russian history, and it stretches back a very long way. Frequently, this is described as Mr. Putin being aggressively expansionist. And I think that's a wrong way of seeing what Putin and indeed Russia is doing, and it's not just Putin. I would say this is aggressive defense, and I would say uh, you can see that, again, stretching back into that continuum of history. The Russians are still trying to come to terms with 1991. When something as dramatic as that happens in the life of a power, it takes more than one generation for people to get their heads around it. And this country is still ruled by people who were adults working in the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union collapsed, as far as they were concerned, completely without warning. Um, in Russian eyes, what they're trying to do is to shore up and keep the West out of what they see as being their security perimeter, their economic perimeter, uh, and their zone of political influence. And that explains what they've done in Ukraine, which is clearly a huge miscalculation on the part of the leadership. It explains their policy in Moldova, in Georgia, in Armenia, in Central Asia, in Belarus, and indeed in the Arctic. <coughs> The main justification that Putin has used to try to sell his Ukrainian operation to his own domestic audience is that there was an existential threat to Russia, that if he had not, as it were, taken Sevastopol, which in practice he already held in strategic terms, that the US fleet was going to be there within this, well within this security perimeter. We may know that this is complete nonsense, but uh, that is widely believed across Russia. I mean, does this explain Putin's popularity ratings despite the, fall, the oil price fall? No, I think Putin's popularity ratings, I mean, Crimea was very popular. Uh, I don't think Syria is popular. I don't think foreign adventurism is, is, is popular. Uh, I think Putin's popularity ratings are somewhat overstated uh, if you just take the sort of high polling numbers. Uh, I think there is a sort of Ronald Reagan Teflon effect that the Russian people are pretty discontented with the way the country is being run, with corruption, the state of the economy, falling living standards, lousy infrastructure, law and order, you can go on and on. 
but they are still not connecting that with the leader, and they are still, I think, very worried that if he were to go, you might get back into a replay of the early 1990s, which he assiduously builds up as the most horrible period in Russian history. So is this a um, Russian policy period or a Putin policy period? Well, I think the Russian view of their perimeter and the need to defend it, and I would include Syria in that, I think we ought to get on to Syria, um, is something that uh, is not fundamentally different from what we saw in, 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 in the Yeltsin period, uh, and I think it's, it, it again stems, you can, you can trace it way, way back into, into Russian history. Um, if you take Syria, what was he actually doing in Syria? Was that expansionist? No, it wasn't expansionist at all. He was told last summer that his ally, Assad, was in danger of falling within months if he didn't do something to shore him up. Russia has vital national interests. It's its sole military ally remaining in that region. It has a naval base and an air base. And he went <coughs> in there to defend that national interest. Now he has a problem, which is a problem not unfamiliar to Western policymakers, which is how you get out. Uh, and he really needs some form of settlement in Syria uh, because otherwise he is going to have to stay on shoring up the regime. I don't think it has to be Assad. He's made it very clear. He's prepared to get rid of him. Is that popular in Russian terms? No. Foreign adventurism is not what people want. Um, Russian soldiers coming back in body bags is as unpopular in Russia, where people tend to only have one son anyway, as it is in, in any Western society. They actually have gone to great lengths to conceal the deaths of Russian soldiers in Ukraine. Uh, so whereas Crimea was a popular act because it was taking back something that they reckoned was theirs, um, Syria is something that is necessary, but if it involved Russian troops going in, um, which there's no suggestion of happening uh, in large numbers, I mean, that is to say in, 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 in fighting formation, I don't think that would be popular at all. Can I just complete by simply mentioning that there are, I think, five really important constraints on, on Russia, if you're thinking of <laughs> Russia as an aggressive, growing power, which it isn't, and just to list them without any detail, they are the sclerosis of this regime, which is locked into personal interests and very stagnant policies and is not capable of reinventing itself. Secondly, it is the economy, which is in a very, very weak and declining state, not just because of sanctions. Indeed, essentially, it went into this decline before the current crisis in 2013 because of the policies of Mr. Putin. Thirdly, it is population and consent. The Russian people would not consent to an attempt to play the role of a global power, and it is a falling population, and that is a real problem for them. Fourthly, it is the military. They're partially modernized. They've had some investment after years of no investment. They can achieve an effect against weak opposition, and this is Douglas's territory, but they are not, I think, capable of projecting power at long range around the globe. And fifthly, and far from the least important, there is China. China is a constraint on Russia. Russia is very nervous about China. It is, in a way, frightened of China. And one of the things that Putin has done that is very unpopular with the Russian elite is to put Russia in hock to China. It is to strike a series of deals from a position of weakness very much to the advantage of the Chinese. And I think that is a real constraint as well. And between Russia and Russia, how global conflict be managed. So no, I don't think that it, it, it leads to a, uh, a major change in the way that Russia functions. Okay. Thanks very much. Mr. Lute, um, I mean, I, 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 I was pointed about the EU. I, I've, got, I've got to ask the same question of NATO. I mean, has NATO got some hard lessons to learn from the last few years, um, or is this a, essentially a case of managing Russia? Well, uh, first of all, working at NATO, I have a sharp eye for emerging consensus. Uh, and I think we have an emerging consensus here that the answer to Clark's question, Cold War redux, is no. Uh, and that, I think, certainly is the view uh, at NATO. Uh, I'd also uh, uh, agree and corroborate from the halls of NATO headquarters the basic view of Russia that my colleagues have outlined here. So uh, essentially, uh, there's a sense that, yes, there's a new, more assertive, maybe even more aggressive Russia, but fundamentally, Russia is a state in decline. And we have conversations in NATO headquarters about states in decline and arrive at two fundamental models, states in rapid decline which typically lead to chaos and breakdown, and states in gradual decline. And we ask ourselves, which of these two models would we uh, have our nearest 
most militarily capable neighbor with thousands of nuclear weapons uh, move along. Uh, obviously, uh, trying to manage Russia's decline seems more attractive than, uh, than uh, a failed state um, on, uh, of that size and magnitude on, on NATO's border. Um, I do think, to, to get to your, your question, I do think NATO is at a fundamental um, breaking point, or not breaking point, a phase line perhaps, or an inflection point uh, in its long history. So just a couple weeks ago, we passed the 67-year uh, anniversary of the, the signing of the Washington Treaty. I think that we're in a period today that is only rivaled, it's only paralleled by the period of sort of 1989 to 1991 in terms of a break in continuity and a shift into a completely different uh, pattern for NATO. And obviously with the end of the Cold War, there's maybe a few other Cold Warriors here in the room. Um, we knew what the first 40 years of NATO looked like. We then went into, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the dissolution of the Soviet Union, about 25 years of a pattern where we imagined that we had um, broken, the, broken the mold of the Cold War and moved even into even maybe a strategic partnership with Russia. And now after that second phase, if you will, I think we're on the verge of another phase line that says, well, we, we didn't quite get it right in terms of this image of strategic partnership with Russia. There are elements of that that made sense. But now it looks more like we're into perhaps an extended period of dealing with Russia's decline, um, and Russia's failure to reform fundamentally in that 25 years after the Cold War. And sort of less a, a military contest with Russia, but more a contest of values, where NATO feels firm in its values, but sees a Russia that has essentially defied all the values codified by, I go all the way back to the UN Charter, but the UN Charter, the Helsinki Accords, uh, the NATO-Russia Founding Act, uh, all of the values under, uh, underpinning those agreements have essentially been violated with the seizing of Crimea and then the destabilizing of the Donbass. So we're in a new phase, um, and it looks uh, familiar. I think the hazard for NATO, and maybe the hazard for the West, is it might look a little too familiar. And there could be a rush to revert to something that seems familiar, the Cold War. I mean, even the, the, the opening question of the opening session in the Aspen Forum seems a little too familiar, doesn't it? We should be careful not to associate too much these conditions today with what seemed familiar, which is the Cold War. So does Russia have now a veto on NATO expansion now until it settles down to this this post this post post USSR state that, that you that you speak about? Well look, I, I think the I think Russia plays an important part in the strategic environment and the strategic environment will put a break on NATO expansion. Um, and if you accept the premises that we've heard here about Russia's internal weakness and perhaps steady decline and so forth, um, it may not make sense uh, to push further now and maybe even try and maybe accelerate or destabilize that decline. So uh, in practical terms, um, I don't think there's much additional room in the near term, next several years perhaps, or maybe even longer, uh, for additional uh, NATO uh, expansion. You know, the policy line, of course, is that the open door remains open. In fact, it's embedded in uh, Article 10 of the Washington Treaty, which says that NATO's door will remain open for additional new European members. So the, in policy terms, it won't go away, and we won't set it aside. Um, but in practical terms, uh, I don't think there's much promise for the next uh, several years anyway. Can I just butt in on that one, John? Um, NATO made probably the most disastrous decision of its entire history at the Bucharest summit 2008 where it adopted a paragraph on Georgia and Ukraine which said on the one hand they will be members of NATO and on the other hand they can't have membership action plans right now so go away. So it faced in both directions. This was utterly, utterly stupid. If you took Russia out of the equation, Russia's never had a veto on NATO membership self-evidently. Take Russia out of the equation. It made no sense for NATO in 2008 to even think of bringing <coughs> Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. It was not in NATO's interest to do so, for differing reasons in those two cases. In the case of Ukraine, partly because of its size, partly because of its condition, and partly because at that stage, 
no more than a quarter at the most of the population of Ukraine wanted to be in NATO, in the case of Georgia, because it does not make sense for NATO to put its footprint into a very, very volatile region of the world. It has enough other issues to deal with. There was no benefit to NATO in either of these things. What is critical now, and I think very difficult for Douglas and his colleagues, is sustaining NATO cohesion. And we need to work on that. And NATO cohesion could not possibly be enhanced by going back into uh, expansionism. It wasn't actually expansionism because the open door policy was countries applying to join NATO, not NATO going out and asking. But that, that was, um, we went down that track and it was a disaster. So we don't need to go down it again. And that's nothing to do with Russian vetoes. It's about what is good for NATO, this really important alliance. If I, I may mean, just add on that, the, the treaty itself actually has the three requirements from, for applicants, right? It must represent the values of the treaty. So these are democratic values and, and so forth. Uh, they must contribute to the collective defense. So imagine now the string of aspirants. Do they really contribute to collective defense? And then third, it's got to be a t decision taken at 28. In other words, it's got to be a consensus decision. So to my colleague's point, there's no way we're going to get consensus uh, any time in, in the near future on adding sort of Georgia uh, or Ukraine. I think what I was getting at is, it, is there not a danger that NATO becomes reactive to Russian actions rather than shaping those actions. Uh, you know, the, the, the criticism could be that in the, in the, in, in the, in the crisis that we're still in, you know, we have played catch up very effectively in some respects. But if, if we're talking about an uncertain view of Russia in the coming years as it settles, what is the, what well, is look, the, what is the way that NATO can actually take control well, of the situation? Well, fundamentally, NATO is a defensive uh, alliance, so that puts it in the reaction mode. Uh, and fundamentally, it's a, it's a body of 28 that have agreed that internally and collectively, we're going to abide by international commitments, which also gives us some sort of standards uh, that, that govern our behavior. When you're dealing with a, in a contest with a, an, op, an opposing number, an opposing party like Russia, which it has the initiative, because he can choose to move into the Donbass or not, uh, or he can choose to move to Syria or not, and an opponent or a uh, opposing number who throws out the rules and makes up his own rules and is not bound by international commitments, then we're always going to be a bit reactive. But I don't think we would have NATO any other way. Okay. Um, before I open this up to the floor, uh, one last question for the whole panel. Um, Russia, the West, and ISIL, partner or uh, participant? I mean, how do you, how do you see... Uh, the re relationship developing, not just about Syria, but, but, the, but the, what used to be called the global war on terrorism, the, the, the counter-ISIL campaign. <laughs> no one wants it to reminds that. me of the consul. Everyone looks at the United States. Uh, sorry. Um, look, there are a number of, even under Putin, and even given his um, aggressive actions over the last years, there have remained a number of policy portfolios where we have found ways to cooperate. So, I mean, fundamentally, I, I suppose the premier example is the Iran nuclear accord. That would not have happened uh, if Russia had not been part of that. Uh, Assad would have um, his full arsenal of chemical weapons today uh, if we had not cooperated with Russia and uh, done away with those. Um, an American astronaut does not get to the space station today. Uh, without cooperation with Russia. And there's CT cooperation, counterterrorism cooperation going on with Russia as well. So one thing that I think separates and distinguishes this period from the Cold War is that there are these policy areas where we can continue to cooperate. I think it's, there is some promise that we might add Syria to that list, but it's a bit too soon to tell. Um, I think what we'll really be telling is if, if Russia uh, first of all, shifts the weight of its military effort onto ISIS and away from the Assad opposition forces. And that's, that's a mixed picture right now. Uh, but not long ago, something like 90% of the Russian strikes were against uh, Assad uh, opposition uh, parties. Um, so that'll be important to watch. The second thing is how do they play a constructive role in the political process? By bringing Assad and the regime figures and importantly, Iran and Hezbollah and the other members of this sort of counter, counter ISIL coalition, if you're still with me, right? Can they bring that group of players to the political table? 
And I think that's, that's just too soon to tell. Okay. If, sorry. sorry. I'm just going to say, um, on this issue, as on, I think, <coughs> all other issues, we should have a transactional relationship with Russia. We should work together where it is in our interest to do so, where those interests overlap. I think what happened over Iran nuclear was quite a good example of that. Um, the problem that we have with terrorism is not that you know, we're all against terrorism, because self-evidently we are, and they don't like ISIL any more than we do. It's a question of how you do it. And Douglas was rightly talking earlier about the gulf in values and the fact that they do not have any respect, this current regime in Russia, for the rule of law, be it domestic law, international humanitarian law, or whatever. And if you look at the example of Chechnya, we were in no sense in favor of the Chechen secessionists who were using terrorism to try to uh, secede from Russia. But the way in which uh, the Putin regime waged its war against Chechnya, and indeed this is a continuing conflict that goes on in the Caucasus now, was completely unacceptable to us because it was in grotesque breach of international humanitarian law. So we could not align with it. Putin just wanted us to say, we're all against terrorism, so you guys back me in Chechnya, and was furious when we didn't, and then accused us of backing the other side. Uh, so the how question is important too and has to be factored in. But if I may, I think also the who question is important because uh, there's this question of who's, who's a terrorist and who's not a terrorist. So I mean, there's a definitional problem, there's an operational problem because we do have forces in Syria operating in close proximity to one another. Um, and then there's the question of the deeper question of values and basis of things. I mean, that's a problem within NATO as well. It can be, yeah, that's right. I mean, if you, look at, if you look at our Turkish ally, for example, we don't have common definition of who's a terrorist and who's not a terrorist in that example either. I, mean, there's, there's, I get very worried about this, this conversation in particular because I think that, that the, the, the atmosphere of mistrust between Moscow and Washington in particular um, at the moment is such that um, uh, I, I find it hard to see how we're going to get to a conversation that allows us to overcome some of these differences. And some of these definitional differences are, are, are very deeply held. I think that Russia genuinely does not see a distinction between ISIS and other anti-Assad combatant, combatants in, uh, in, in, in Syria. It sees them as part of the same problem um, to the extent that we in the West continue to insist that they need to be treated differently and there needs to be a differentiated fight. Um, I think they begin to see us very much as part of the problem. Uh, they certainly see Turkey very much as part of the problem. Um, and they, they see this as a problem that if it is not resolved um, in Syria, um, will come home uh, to Russia. There are thousands of young men from the North Caucasus, from Dagestan in particular, who have gone down to fight um, uh, in the region. They're very well aware of this, and they're very well, uh, well aware of the fact that they can come home uh, and, uh, and, and fight in, um, in Russia. I think Russia thinks that its stakes in this are higher than ours uh, are, and that it, um, uh, if it wants to be successful, and, and, and successful it is, again, keeping the fight there rather than coming back to the Caucasus, um, uh, that it may have to um, uh, uh, fight not uh, uh, alongside us or with us, but uh, quite separately. This is a really important point that, that is often missed, and that is that Russia has the largest number of foreign, Sunni foreign fighters of any Western uh, European state that have moved from Russia into the fight in Syria and Iraq, joined ISIS, and uh, I don't think we've yet seen the beginning of the return the return on that, uh, that phenomenon, as we have perhaps in Paris and Brussels and, and so forth. Uh, but they have the largest number. They're Sunnis. Uh, the Russians uh, in the Syria uh, campaign are aligned uh, against the Sunnis. And I think there's, there's a big issue there with, the, with one of the eight branches of ISIS, one of the geographical eight branches of ISIS being in the North Caucasus. Mm -hmm. All right, I'd like to open it up to the floor now, and, uh, and we don't want to get too cosy, especially if you've got some uh, thing to raise with the panel where, where you may have a different perspective. If you could identify yourself uh, when you ask a question. So. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, gentlemen. I'm Kevin Barron. I'm executive editor of Defense One. Um, welcome, and thanks for having the panel. My question is back to the question of is this Putin or is this Russia? Um, I posed this question to the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Dempsey, at the Aspen Forum last year or maybe the year before that, uh, because just a few years ago, we were being told how the United States was increasing uh, to a great rate the amount of exercises we're having with Russia, a very good uh, opening relationship, 
military to military, especially at the senior level. And there was a sense that there was, this was some part of Putin, some part of the military that supported Ukraine and all the other adventurisms, but that there was also a much larger other part of the military, perhaps, or the population that just wasn't, wasn't supportive but was laying low. Is there any sense of that now, how much of this is Putin versus Russia? Um, yeah, I'll kick it off. I mean, I, I think um, Washington certainly seems to have come to the conclusion um, that it will not have a fruitful relationship with Putin, right? um, but that it could have a fruitful relationship with somebody else, even if that somebody else is not fully democratically legitimate. Uh, in Russia, and I think there's some truth to that. I think it's very difficult at this point to have a transactional relationship with Putin, and I think that to the extent that we're interested in transactional relationships, that can change. I do think, however, that whoever comes into power is going to be dragged back into the same kinds of behaviors that uh, Putin uh, is, uh, is exhibiting, because I think that they're driven by um, the interests of the Russian elite, right? And to say that this is Russia, that is what I mean. I don't think that this sort of confrontation is in the interest of the vast majority of the Russian population, but the vast majority of the Russian population isn't being asked what's in its interest, right? Um, there um, uh, is an elite, in fact, which at this point is probably not interested in this depth of confrontation. Um, but if this confrontation is to a certain extent at least driven by the fact that Russia needs to make some part of the world safe for kleptocracy, right, um, then um, uh, they have very much an interest in, in, in making sure that's, that, that, that remains safe for them. That's how they're making their, their money. Right? Uh, they're not going to be competitive in um, a, a highly institutionalized rule of law uh, economic environment. Um, and uh, so they do need to keep Russia governed more or less the, the way it is, and to the extent that um, EU expansion um, is a threat to that, um, even through things like association agreements, um, uh, puts pressure on them to change the way they do business domestically, um, uh, they're going to want a leader in the Kremlin who's going to stand up for their interests. I, I mean, I agree. I think uh, my colleagues have made a persuasive argument that it's the underlying conditions in Russia that have uh, resulted in Putin being in power. And, and I think, therefore, uh, even if Putin were to pass from the scene, those same underlying conditions would largely dominate um, a successor regime. So we may be in for a long haul here. Uh, if you buy the premise that Rus Russia is fundamentally a state in decline, and that over the last 25 years it essentially took a pass on an opportunity to reform, its economy, its politics, and so forth. We don't turn around those factors quickly. So my guess is that we're in for the long haul here. I don't think it did take a pass on the opportunity to reform for 25 years. From 1988 until 2003, end of maybe 2004, mm -hmm. Russia was on a broadly convergent course with the West. It was in a re broadly reforming, modernizing mode. A uh, huge amount was done in Putin's first term, both in terms of domestic reform and restructuring, and in terms of rebuilding very close, increasingly close relations with the West. We tend to forget that. Um, he's been on a different course since 2004. I think Putin has articulated and manipulated very skillfully uh, popular feelings in Russia. So to that extent, I think he does represent a large body of opinion there. He leads and represents a very powerful conservative constituency within the Russian elite, obviously heavily dominated by security and military elements, but not only, uh, and self-interested people who have made gigantic amounts of money. Um, but this is not the only faction in the elite. In the 1990s, there was a liberal modernizing element that actually is still represented within Putin's regime, but doesn't have a lot of traction. But if you look at the governor of the central bank, the Ministry of uh, Economic Development and Trade, some of the deputy prime ministers and so on, uh, there are still some liberal modernizers within the system. Beyond that, in the Russian intelligentsia and the business elite, there are people who would want a very different sort of Russia. And Dmitry Medvedev wrote an article last September at great length in which he articulated the case for this. He's not capable of leading it, he's too weak a figure. No, he didn't even write the article, actually he signed it Interestingly enough, it was seen by Putin before it was published, and among other things, it called for a radically improved relationship with the West, not least in order to get more Western investment into Russia. I think what's going to happen is that I don't think Putin is capable of changing. Um, we're going to have to wait this one out, if you like. 
he is leading the country downwards. He is leading it towards increasingly difficult territory. This regime will eventually end in failure. I think then there'll be a rather messy period. But I think at that point, there is a serious chance that they will decide to revert to the course that they were on from 88 to 2003 and try to modernize the country, which has considerable potential in terms of human resource, brain, as well as wealth, uh, to become a much more modernized state in their own interests. We may have to wait a long time for that to happen. Remember that Robert Mugabe is still running Zimbabwe down, and he's still in power. There is sadly a sort of Mugabe thesis over Russia, uh, in which case it may be a very long game. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure if I want to go down that, uh, that comparative route, but uh, just to close this, this, this uh, topic off, uh, Putin, strategist or tactician? You talked about skill, uh, sk how skillful he can be. Is he, is, is he strategic or tactical, essentially? Well, I'll take a first stab at that. I, I think he's an opportunist. I think he's more a tactician than he is uh, a strategist. I mean, if he were a strategist, I mean, at least by sort of Western strategic logic, right? Why would you do something that, so for example, in Ukraine, that unites Ukrainians as they've never been united before? Or why would you uh, seize Crimea when you already had the base there and it was really not under threat, uh, but doing so puts you under sanctions for an indefinite period of time and essentially cast you as a as uh, the renegade in the international order. Uh, why would you take steps along the periphery of NATO to unite NATO in a way that, quite frankly, I didn't expect when I went there. I now take great credit for the solidarity of NATO, but it was actually Vladimir Putin that, that solidified NATO uh, in a very helpful way. Uh, and uh, why would you take steps that unite the European Union and the United States in a sanction regime uh, at a time when your economy is already under stress. So there's some strategic illogic here that doesn't, I think, point to sort of a grand strategic plan. His strategic objective is to retain power yeah. for himself and his associates, for the 200 people or so in an assortment of clans who underpin him uh, and whom he leads. He is a very skilled opportunist. Uh, and can move fast and flexibly and keeps people in doubt all the time as to what his next move is going to be. Even people in Russia simply do not know. The decision-making is very much centered in himself. If he was a strategist, he would not have ignored the advice from people very close to him, like Alexei Kudrin, uh, 12 years ago, that the way that he was shifting Russian domestic policy-making uh, economic and uh, indeed wider than economic in terms of restructuring, uh, was going to lead Russia into a new period of stagnation, which Russia has been in since 2013. The projected growth rates for Russia when it comes out of its current recession are only in the region of about 1.5% of GDP, which is not enough to achieve the objective that Putin articulated when he came into power of catching up with the more advanced nations of the world. So in terms of Russia's social and economic development, quite apart from its, its external position, Putin has, been, uh, has not pursued any kind of coherent or sensible strategy. But he has acted in a way that has enriched and empowered a small group of people who are now in a very, very strong position within this weakening country. I would agree with that broadly. I mean, I think that, that Putin's strategic objectives are entirely domestic, um, that the international field is, um, is important to him, but uh, only to the extent that um, it helps him uh, achieve what he thinks he needs to achieve at home. Um, but I also think that part, the cornerstone of his strategy really is uh, to be inscrutable. Um, the minute that his strategy becomes um, legible uh, and transparent, um, people, whether domestically or uh, overseas, can, be, uh, can begin to outmaneuver him, can begin to plan um, uh, for responses. Right? And because of all the reasons that, uh, that the ambassadors have both mentioned uh, for which Russia is not institutionally strong, is not conventionally powerful, Putin has to maintain his power and the power of his uh, elite by um, managing, creating, manufacturing, and manipulating uncertainty. Uh, and that's something that he does um, extremely well, again, both domestically and, and internationally. Thanks very much. We started a bit late. I'll take time for one last question. Then 
Thank you. Richard Barrett from Sufan Group. Uh, I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about the Russian spat with Turkey and the likely trajectory of that and the extent to which that's a bilateral issue or an issue that involves NATO more broadly. Thank you. Well, from NATO's perspective, it's a NATO issue, obviously, because Turkey's one of the 28. Um, in fact, it's probably, as you imagine, the alliance geographically perhaps is the, the one of the 28 under most duress right now. Um, it is, it borders Syria and Iraq, the 1,500 kilometer border, essentially with ISIS. Um, and then of course it has all its own internal domestic struggles as well, most prominently from the Turkish perspective against uh, having to do with their Kurdish, internal Kurdish challenge. So um, from our perspective, this is very much, very much features Turkey as a frontline state. Um, I, I think what has really changed over the, over the last months as Russia has begun military operations right up against the Turkish and sometimes across uh, the Turkish border with Syria. Um, it has uh, illuminated that the challenge to NATO with Russia is not only a Baltic, Polish, sort of eastern flank, Black Sea flank challenge, uh, but it's also a challenge in NATO's southeast corner. So it's, it's both. I mean, Turkey is, uh, obviously this is a NATO challenge, um, but there are bilateral dimensions, Turkish-Russian bilateral dimensions of, poly, of the problem with, that really complicate it. Of course, of course, the two are linked, right? Because an attack on one is an attack on all. So one of the things we're doing carefully in concert with our Turkish allies is to make sure that Turkey tries to retain its position as the, res no, bear with me, the responsible, predictable player along that border when it faces Russia and Russian forces in particular that don't tend to play by the rules and therefore are quite unpredictable and potentially very destabilizing. And this all came to a head in one vignette with the downing of the Russian airplane uh, several months ago. So it's a very, it is perhaps the most delicate 1,500 kilometers of uh, the, NATO, the NATO periphery. Thanks very much. Um, our time's up. Uh, uh, I'd like, on your behalf, I'd like to uh, thank the panel for a really interesting session. And if you join me in, in showing your appreciation too. Thank you. Thank you.